But honestly, straight out, it was toxic and abused children raising toxic and abused children. Yeah. And the lineage goes way back, way before my own parents and their parents. And that in and of itself, that understanding, coming to that understanding has been incredibly healing for me. You are now tuned in. You are now tuned in to Let's Talk About Healing on Hindsight Media Radio, 103.5 FM. Now here's your host, Yvonne Pierre. Hello and welcome to Let's Talk About Healing, where I have conversations with guests about various topics on healing the mind, body, and spirit. Today, we're going to be talking about healing from a toxic family with my guest, Susan Gold, who was raised in a chaotic and challenging family system. Susan is an author and consultant. Her book, Toxic Family Transforming Childhood Trauma into Adult Freedom, is the trajectory of her journey. Her joy is in inspiring others to transform their own traumatic experiences into priceless gifts. Susan, welcome to the show. Yvonne, thanks for having me. And as you were reading the introduction, I just was moved. It's taken a lot of bravery for me to allow that to become the title of my book. Mm. Um, It wasn't my initial title. Initially, I called it Magical Illumination. Mm. Uh, transforming childhood trauma into adult freedom. And my publisher said, that's not really what this is. This <laughs> yeah. is a, this is about a toxic family system. And I'm like, I can't say that. I can't throw my family under the bus. Right. I love them. And, and I've come around to a great place of healing, but honestly, straight out, it was toxic and abused children raising toxic and abused children. Yeah. And the lineage goes way back, way before my own parents and their parents. And that in and of itself, that understanding, coming to that understanding has been incredibly healing for me. Yes, I just wanted to mention that right out of the gate. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. I believe every family has, (laughs) <laughs> one or more um, members that are considered toxic. Um, I have to admit that there was a time period in my life where I became toxic because of all the toxins spewed on me as a kid. I was very negative and mad at the world. I was drinking and partying and doing all these things for the age of 12. Um, that's that's around the age it started smoking cigarettes and smoking weed and drinking and all these things. And, but I was angry at the world because I, here I am a kid trying to understand why my father was murdered and why I was in this toxic environment and the various forms of abuse that included sexual abuse. But I took the time to do the work on me once I recognized, you know, the behaviors that came from that. Um, I didn't like who I was becoming. So I took time to really be intentional about changing and not really changing who I am, but because who I am was there, but it was covered with debris and covered with ashes and covered with all this soot that caused me to to respond the way I did. So I didn't know I was toxic. So anyway, I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> you you kind of already touched on it, Susan, but give us a glimpse of what your childhood was like. I will. I just want to first say I completely relate to what you were just talking about and the ashes and the soot. Yeah. Yeah. And I too, like you, have have come full circle to realize that ashes and soot is 
is actually a gift, which may sound so bizarre. My childhood was really traumatic. Um, and I want to say I have three brothers and a sister, and we all have very different experiences growing up in that same family dynamic. Um, my father was, was an academic. He was fun. He was the hero. My mother was stay at home and, you know, overweight, obese, surly, you know, just that's the way that it looked. But when I got some perspective, I saw a way different picture. My father would start drinking early. I remember 7.30 AM, you'd hear the the cabinet open and the cork (laughs) unbuckle from its place. And you'd hear glug, 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 glug. And I remember hearing that really clearly and just thinking nothing of it. He'd come in the door whenever it was fitting. You never knew when that was going to be. And I'd go run to him because I was just relieved. Daddy was home, you know, my savior. And he'd lift me up and he'd smell funny. He smelled like whiskey and Old Spice and Scope, like all mixed together. And he'd rub me, you know, on my cheek against his whiskers and give me a whisker hug and say, are you a tiger or are you a baby? And I'd be like, I'm a tiger. You know, and he'd just hide everything else that transpired in the house that day. Yeah. I mean, my mom had five kids before she was even 30 and she was responsible for us. My dad was an eternal Peter Pan. He was a narcissistic alcoholic, in my opinion, um, certainly intoxicated almost 24 seven and a serial cheater. He was cheating even before the honeymoon, practically. Mm. Um, And my mom was a dutiful wife. She kept the house clean and made homemade meals and from scratch birthday cakes. But she also was on diet pills, which was speed. And I didn't even put that together until my 20s. So she was a pill head. So we were raised by an alcoholic (laughs) and a pill head. And you didn't know what was going to happen when. And the first time that I crystal clear, I have a lot of of feeling sensation and I have bits and pieces of flashback um, that come to me. But the first time I really knew I was in danger and something was off, I was about four Um, my mom was giving us all baths in this really tiny bathroom on the upstairs, the kind of attic comes together in that, that triangle shape. And it was my turn to get in that gray water. And I was excited and I I was just excited to get in and squirming. And my mom just switched. Her eyes became like slits and it wasn't my mom anymore. Mm. And she said, why are you being such a brat? And it, it just terrified me. I, di- I didn't know what I had done wrong, what had happened, but the whole energy of that room shifted on a dime. And she grabbed me so hard and she started to beat me and beat me. And the room started to brown out and swirl. Yeah. And all that shame and all her anger and her rage, I took it on. I thought it was my fault. But at that moment, too, when I came to, I knew I wasn't safe and I knew my mommy wasn't okay. There was something wrong. Yeah. So that was the that was the real pivotal moment. Um, and it it built from there. I mean, denial was <laughs> our middle name and our family. And we just, you know, we just keep standing up and pretending and standing up, but there was so much violence and there was abuse of every kind, physical, emotional, sexual, Mm. psychological. And I just kept focus on when I was going to get out and how I was going to get out. Yeah. I was on my beanbag on my belly in our basement And I saw Barbara Walters (laughs) and I was like, I want to be like that lady. And I want to go to New York city. 
-hmm. And ultimately, that's what I did. I left our family home the morning after I graduated from high school. I graduated high school on a Friday night and I left Saturday morning at quarter to eight. And basically, I'd, I didn't come back. I didn't go back very yeah. often. Yeah. Um, and like you, I turned all that dysfunction and confusion and anger inside. Yeah. And projected it outward. Yeah in really bizarre ways. It was almost like eating rat poison. And I'm sure my perpetrator was going to die, right. <laughs> but really it's like right. me. And ultimately I too, like you, I ended up in similar situations that I was in in, how, in my home. I was being sexually harassed in the workplace and Barbara Walters ended up being my exercise client. And she, she wanted to come to work with me when she found out what was going on and confront my boss. But I quit not having another job. And I had the opportunity to go into another job that Barbara was going to refer me into uh, working her, for her fiance, as, uh, who was head of Lorimar. And I couldn't even, I couldn't even dream of working in an assistantship. I couldn't be subservient like that. And I was 25 in New York City living on my own. And I had maybe a month of income in the bank. And I created my own talent brokerage firm because I just couldn't work within the system with all that anger and rage and hate. And ultimately, I was successful but I had to face alcoholism and addiction first because yeah. I used it to blot out all that pain that was perpetrated. And once I got clean, that's when all the memories started really coming back. An honor to have worked with um, Ms. Barbara Walters. Um, what a giant. She paved the way for so many, so many people in general, but especially women in the field of journalism and even beyond that she touched so many lives my condolences to you and all that knew and loved her um so what was the greatest lesson you learned from her and or <laughs> the best advice she's giving you she gave you well it was just so magnificent to essentially collide with her under the circumstances that I did after, you know, watching her growing up and then to be right there in her living room with her and, you know, training her. She's so lovely. She was a girl's girl. She was just one of the girls, you know, I mean, she was special, obviously, but, but that morning that I was so shaken after what had happened the day before she could read it. I mean, she was a she was an exceptional interviewer for a reason. She was intuitive and she could totally read it and yeah. got that information out of me because I was like a steel trap. I was not going to let anybody know my business and certainly not where I was vulnerable. Right. Um, and then her response to say, I'm going to come to work with you and we're going to confront this guy together, like like to be a friend and yeah. and so supportive yeah. just really supportive so i mean she really she really taught me to be authentic and genuine mm -hmm. and that it was okay to ask for help and she also taught me that we're really all one and we've we all sh have shared experiences they may not be identical but the feelings are shared and she was going to support me. I obviously hit a nerve in her and going back, I discovered that she had been harassed in the workplace inappropriately. And I'm yeah. sure she was. Yeah. I mean, she's yeah. such a pioneer. Women did not do what she was doing yeah. um, then in blazing that trail. But yeah, I think, I think that was the strongest lesson, compassion. Mm. Yeah, I've heard um, a lot of people that have worked with her and was saying, you know, how tough, you know, she was. But it seemed like even in her toughness, it was love. What a blessing to have shared that experience with her. And thank you for sharing it with us.
once you recognize what is happening, what has happened, well, first I want to point out that, you know, when you're going through it, you don't realize initially that anything is different than what other families are going through. It, it kind of seems normal because you don't know. You don't really know that's not common, the, the behaviors and all that. And even with the beating, the physical abuse, we, we saw it as discipline. You know, a lot of parents saw it as I'm just disciplining my child, but sometimes parent is taking out their anger on the child and, and that's when it becomes abuse. So I think it's awesome that at the age of four, you realize that, okay, something's going on here. And then as a teenager, going through, you know, like, okay, I'm leaving. That's very commendable because a lot of, a lot of children either don't make it out or they don't think that they don't have the courage to leave. So I want to give you kudos on that. And your turning point, you, you, you were working at, you started your own company, you were in New York. How was that, how hard was it to get a hold of that turn? You know what I mean? Like some turns are sharp. <laughs> some terms, turns are, you know, wider turns. How was the turning point for you? I've had several turning points in my life. Mm -hmm. Certainly when I left my home, that was a huge turning point. Yeah. Um, and yes, you're right. It did take a lot of courage. I was really fearful, but I knew I just had to put my head down and go. And yeah. I did have a lot of tenacity. Um, I mean, my first deal in my own company was to knock on the factory door and get Andy Warhol to do a commercial that he didn't really want to do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but the, the next real turning point was understanding that I was an addict and that I needed to get clean to face truth because I couldn't have truth in my life without a level playing field. Yeah. And then the next turning point was to understand I had issues with depression and that I needed, I needed medical attention. Yeah to be able to get through that. Cause I didn't want that. that I, was that was a lot to cope with. Yeah, <laughs> it was, but I, but Yvonne, I firmly believe that. And I know this may sound odd, but I believe I came here with a mission. Yeah. I believe I came here with a plan yeah. and I believe I came to evolve my soul and I don't think I picked the easier, softer way this time around. <laughs> I think I, yeah. I picked some pretty rough lessons that I've stepped up to and faced with love yeah. each time. And I've had a lot of angelic energy around me. I mean, as a kid, I remember going out in the backyard and wishing myself up on the clouds to escape what was happening to me within my family system. And I just, I remember feeling the protection and, and I've turned to that multiple times um, yeah. in my being, but with the clinical depression, it, it was a young angel. And I was in, I was four and a half years clean in a rehab and they wanted me to take an antidepressant to boost my serotonin level up to where I could function. And I said, no, I'm sober. I don't take medication. <laughs> Yeah. And this young 17 year old angelic heroin addict, she had hair down to her waist, just beautiful ringlets. And she had such beautiful energy. And I think this was her sixth rehab or something, poor girl. And she said, you know, if you came here and you weren't an addict and they did blood tests and they showed you, you were low in a certain chemical and that they could raise it by giving you this medicine, would you take it? And I, I was like, yeah, of course. She said, well, and that's when I began taking the medication and I, I ended up using it off and on for 10 years. Um, and it did help me recover. Um, and it did help me learn about 
clinical depression Mm -hmm. and going to that line of wanting to kill myself and pulling back from that and recovering. I knew when I would get to that line again, that I needed help. And ultimately I learned how to create help and support around me without the medication. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was about 10 years off and on, as I said, of, of using that, that practical tool. Um, So I think the ultimate, well, I would hope it's an ultimate, but maybe it's not. I should knock wood. (laughs) I went from New York Yvonne to LA. Um, I was invited by an incredible producing friend of mine. She wanted somebody to help her bring talent to the table of a nationally syndicated talk show that she was launching. Mm -hmm. And so she invited me to join her and I went. And ultimately, I believe I went there to meet one of my biggest gurus, who is my ex husband. And I really thought. I found Prince Charming. He said all the right things. I thought he was really supportive of me. And he almost seemed like he was out of the movies. Mm-hmm. And he was. Yeah. <laughs> because ultimately his mask fell and I saw the narcissist beneath. And his persona was fabricated. Yeah. And I had created a life with this man and had a son. And I had bought our family home. And when I saw the dynamic of the narcissism and what was happening, it was another point of turning. I, I was, I can't do this anymore. I'm, I'm exhausted. My energy is completely drained. I'm flattened. I can't go forward. So I tried one more legal thing to try to make him come to the table, which was creating a post-nuptial agreement. And we got to the last point of contention and I thought we were going to save our marriage. And he folded his arms and his eyes went in those cold slits. And Mm -hmm. he said, I'm hiring an attorney and I'm filing for divorce. And there was this voice on my shoulder that gently said, This is the universe doing for you what you can't do for yourself. Mm. And that was the turning point to really face my fear of abandonment that was so thick. I mean, even in this chaotic home with all the abuse, I was terrified I'd be orphaned. I, I was terrified something would happen and I'd be kicked out of the system, which almost seems like lifetimes ago, you know, some kind of odd belief system that I couldn't let go of. And I was willing to hold on to abusive relationship after abusive relationship until finally it wasn't a choice. And, and that's ultimately where I really stood up and where I really learned to, to value myself and to come to a point where I really could say, you're okay. I I love you. And I'm going to take care of you. I know you've had so much thrown upon you and I have neglected and abandoned you. And I'm not going to do that anymore. And it's up to me. And that's really where I learned to care for myself rather than expecting mom, dad, grandpa, Santa to, yeah. to take care of me, <laughs> right, you know, right. that it was a choice and that I could really drop that victimhood and get off that hamster wheel that I yeah. was running on to try to pull it all together and keep it yeah. together. Yeah. But you know, some people never get to that place. They never accept their part in it and that Um, you know, regardless of what you believe, whether you believe in the universe or God or or whatever, everything does happen for a reason. And it's in the Bible that the power is in the tongue, you know, and that we're given choices and, and he give us signs, 
when when we receive the signs that there's issues going on or or whatever the case is, we have opportunities to self-correct and be better because of what we went through and to recognize that there are some some things that need to change. And even in relationships in your your um, former marriage, to realize that sometimes we choose people that based on how we feel about ourselves at the time and what we feel like we deserve. With a narcissist, they it is what they call it love bombing when they show you a totally different person but also they are able to to recognize things in the women that they pursue that that some unhealed areas that they feel like they can get over you know but I'm glad you got to that place recognizing that you were worth more than that that was very commendable and I think you already touched on how did you learn how to heal? Well, it really started when I got clean. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I really started getting getting onto a spiritual path. I started meditating and getting still yeah. because growing up in a chaotic home can mm-hmm. give you a lot of PTSD mm-hmm. yeah. um, and a lot of inner trauma and yeah. my central nervous system was pretty, pretty splattered. And it wasn't until even fairly recently that I realized how much I had been running. Mm -hmm. Um, And I also used athletics to numb my pain in life. And that I was humbled that even was taken care of. I went from you know, being a nationally ranked ath- master's adult athlete to not mm-hmm. being able to walk around my block. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had to learn to drop yet another persona. Yeah. And really go inside and stop running to realize the wealth of beauty and joy that was right in front of me. Yeah. And the healing really is in the beauty of seeing the profound gift that's under that heavy boulder. Yeah. And, and, and I think the healing process is ongoing. And like you said, you know, there were moments that you realize even now that there were things, there were layers that still needed to be dealt with. And you know, and sometimes it take different situations for you to mag to magnify those areas, whether it's and usually it's relationships with other people or um, recognizing it in somebody else. I know for me, going away from home and going back magnify stuff that I missed, stuff that I didn't recognize when I lived in it. This whole journey of healing is powerful. It's really, really powerful. And I agree with what you said earlier about how we're chosen for this certain path that we have to take. And there were many times where I said, well, okay, why did I have to go through this? Or why did I have to go through that? But there was a time I had to stop asking why and start saying, okay, now what? Now, what do I do with this? How do I move forward? How do I become better and not bitter because of what I've been through and remove the knife out of my own back? (laughs) Yeah. Um, And that takes, that takes a lot of humility and it takes a willingness um, because you get to that point where you're so uncomfortable and it keeps, it keeps coming off in layers. You know, you go over one hurdle and then the next hurdle is there. And I think that's, that's also part of the the wonder of being here on yeah. earth and yeah. certainly in this time but i got a lot of a, a lot of help i used a lot of different modalities i started out with a lot of talk therapy mm-hmm. which was really helpful to learn my story because i never really gave a voice 
to it. I was just busy achieving the next right thing that society and culture told me I needed. So while that was helpful, I found I landed in the same place I started and I needed to dig deeper, which was really on a somatic level for me. Mm -hmm. So I really followed um, different modalities and therapies that pinpointed trauma within my body and Mm -hmm. released more trauma that way. And then I started exploring, you know, the spiritual path and the many different masters and gurus and seekers and just regular human beings that that are trudging the road and, and really coming to understand even further that, that beauty of this story that, that I am walking through here and how profound it is and how to learn to start to trust. Mm -hmm. Cause my, my trust button is still, pretty busted in places. You know, I have a lot of understanding, but, you know, after that seven years I spent on my own and I had been addicted since second grade and uh, Mm. Billy Fritz on the playground, you know, I always had to have some kind of male attention. So after I got out of that marriage, it was, it was seven years and I had had one date with intention and only because friends of mine set it up and it was a big flashy, you know, Academy award winning director and Emmy winning yeah. producer. And the red flag was raised. He, sh- he showed his spots, you know, yeah. <laughs> before we even got in the car. And I was like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Th- this isn't the direction I'm going to go in this time. So I learned, but yeah. I also, I found myself shutting down. Um, I was also a single mom, so I was really focusing on my son and taking care of him and and my business and, right. um, you know, but I was really shut down to any kind of loving relationship. And then it was, again, the universe, like, batting me on the head and in the most wondrous of ways, you know, introduced a real human being in my life. And we were friends first. And both of us went sort of kicking and screaming into a relationship, but it's so different than anything I've ever experienced. Like, you know, last night I had, I was going to a gathering and he goes, Oh, I'll drive you. I'm like, what? You'll drive (laughs) me? Like, wow, really? (laughs) And he's like, you got to raise your standards. (laughs) Yeah, you know, I I went through that too with my husband. Uh, we've been together; it'll be twenty five years in August, and since we've been together, and I had so many things that I had to um, deal with within myself because I was because of the trauma and because of not understanding love and learning the whole language of love and, and realizing, you know, uh, what love looked like, you know? So, so I understand that whole process of just him being a gentleman, you know, was not that the other one were other ones were monsters, but, you know, he was different. He was totally different than what I was used to. And, um, we started off as friends also. And I think that's key to to um, a relationship is being friends. And I'm happy for you. I'm glad you were able to find that. And this, this healing journey is ongoing. It's, <laughs> it's I, I really believe it's forever. You know, we're always healing from something, whether it's physical, whether it's emotional or spiritual. We're always on on a healing journey. And it took a lot of courage for you to, to heal. And you said something a few minutes ago about how beautiful this journey is. And I wanted to point that out because you could have easily, you know, look back and say, ah, 
you know, I hate my life, or you could have looked back and saw all the negativity, but you didn't. You saw the beauty in the pain, the beauty in the ashes, and in the process of growing and healing in his journey, in his life journey. And also, I wanted to point out how the meditation and the spiritual journey that you chose to go on in this process, because I really believe that's what life is about. I really believe that, you know, it's all about the spiritual growth um, that we get from our story and from what we go through. So I just wanted to take that moment to commend you on all of it, on, um, on on your continued growth process and healing process. Thank you, Yvonne. And, and it, it, it does take courage, but it is just, it's the, it's the shift in the dial and it can be a tiny tweak and you go from this little closet that you're stuck in. That's all dark into this wide, expansive, beautiful plane. And I'm, I'm really hoping that the book that I wrote, um, yeah. delivers that to others yeah. um, and that they can use that as a tool. Mm-hmm. And I'm hoping that I can share that with others one-on-one and in groups um, yeah. so they too can can see that transformation is absolutely possible. Yeah. Since you um, mentioned the book, what do you want people to walk away with after reading your book? I want them to walk away with hope Mm-hmm. And with an, a renewed respect for their own humanity, their own experiences, and a belief that anything is possible. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. And when does it, it ha- is it out already? It's, it's going to come out in March of 2023. Mm-hmm. So if people want to be updated... Um, they just go to susangold.us and then there's a little email form. You'll get a little audio snippet of the first pages of the book to get a little taste. Um, and that's also my website. So they can scroll through that if they want, but um, they'll get updates on when the book's coming out, where they can get it. Um, yeah. That's susangold.us. Awesome. I look forward to reading it. I really do. Um, what is, the greatest lesson you learned through this journey? That I'm a human being and that I'm much more powerful than I've been led to believe and that I need to allow myself to receive that information in and trust that there's a team of light and beauty guiding me and supporting me through this lifetime here on earth and that I can give that to others. I can radiate that to others. I think that's mm. the biggest one. Yeah. Beautiful. That's beautiful. Um, if you could go back in time, what advice would you give yourself? What advice would I give little Susie? Yes. <laughs> Hold on, honey. Hold, just hold on. You're doing beautifully. You're magical. You're beautiful. And be strong. That's going to get better. And all this is just leading to love. Nothing more than love. Yeah. Yeah. It is. I love that. What do you think contributed to how you chose to see what you've been through keeping an open heart I mean you said it when we started our conversation there are so many times that I wanted to shut down that I wanted to check out um, that I wanted to indulge in that victim but ultimately I know that's not the way that would serve me or serve others Yeah. I believe people can and do change if they are willing 
to um, be honest with herself and do the work. I certainly did. <laughs> I certainly changed um, from being the way that I was um, as toxic as I was, but my toxicity um, came from all the things that was spewed on me. Um, not to give myself an excuse, but to recognize where it come from. So there are times that you have to give people grace and there are other times that you have to distance yourself. And it's, it's the discernment of knowing which one, you know, which way to go or how to respond um, to toxic people or family members, um, whether they're family or friends. And, and, but certainly either way is really important to set boundaries. Did you want to add? Well, yeah, I would like to talk about boundaries. Just growing up in the home that I did, boundaries were violated. Um, certainly my personal boundaries were completely vi violated and they became porous. So I, ha I had very few boundaries in my adulthood. I didn't understand that I was even entitled to boundaries. Yeah. And it wasn't just from toxic, my toxic family and the lineage. It was, it was how women were treated and what was just expected. And I don't, I don't hold malice now towards my family. I like you took responsibility yeah. to do the work to examine all that. I had to go through rage. I mean, I did primal screen therapy. I, did, I sat in a group, you know, for, for two years and, and really went through the abuse and grieved and mourned. Mm -hmm. And I confronted um, my perpetrators. Um, I did it in letter form and I did it personally and um, in both circumstances, they denied it, but then said, if that did happen, here's why it happened. Ultimately, I forgave. And I have a loving relationship with my family now. Yeah. Um, they, they were doing the best that they knew how to do. And they also came in to play a role. You know, it's, it's back to that role playing, but yeah. I had to spend a lot of, a lot of time not communicating. I, I went three years without seeing my mother and I lived four hours away from her. I, I couldn't yeah. engage. I would come back suicidal. Um, like you had mentioned, you know, after you see what you were engaged in and the dance and I would come back suicidal. So I just had to. I had to draw that boundary and then I had to be careful. And a lot of our communication was nonverbal mm -hmm. because once my mom passed, I realized I'd been communicating with her the same way when we were on opposite sides of the country. It was really interesting. Yeah. Um, but I, I didn't engage a lot um, with my family once, once I left my home it didn't mean I didn't love them. I just had to go through a process of yeah. understanding my past, understanding the dynamics and working through the grief yeah. of my childhood and the pain and letting go of the hurt and the anger and the rage to come back to forgiveness and love. And I'm still, I'm still careful. Yeah. You have when I, when, yeah, I'm still careful when I see them. Um, but I still, I have love in my heart yeah. for them and I care about them. And I yeah. think that comes from going through a deep process of exploration. And, and ultimately for me, it was forgiveness for some people that's not appropriate. Yeah. But I, I think that for me, I had to find a place of for forgiveness or that toxicity was just going to turn inward yeah. and cause, cause illness. Yeah. Now I want to one give condolences about your mom. Um, 
on with me, I had to learn how to love. Um, and even with the my predator, which was a babysitter, a babysitter son, the main one, but I I never found him. I tried to look for him, but I'm not sure how I would have responded to him. It's probably good I didn't at that time. But I had to also go through a process of forgiveness for my own sanity and my own peace. And as you were saying about having to step away from your family, sometimes you have to do what you need to do to protect that. And so you can process it. And so you can heal and deal with them from a healed place instead of dealing with them from hurt. And healing is about you and about your peace. Forgiveness is not about the other person. It's really about you and really about, and you don't have to lock arms or even speak to the person ever again. It's, it's about not letting whatever happened control you. And have that type of power over you. And that's one of the reasons why I had to um, find peace and let go because I, for a long time, I thought forgiving was letting them off the hook, but that's not what it is at, at all. It's not letting them off the hook. It's, it's accepting, okay, this happened um, and realizing I have to let this go. I have to move on from it, you know, but yeah, for a while, I kept feeling like, you know, why is all this stuff happening to me back to back to back to back? But then I realized I was about 30 years old and I realized, you know, this song came on. I'm still standing. <laughs> and when that song came on, it was a pivotal moment for me. It reminded me that through everything that I've endured, I'm still standing. And when you look at it from that place, it kind of changes things. And that was the beginning of my healing process. That's a, that's an awesome journey. That's that's incredible. And I just am so grateful that you were willing to see it clearly for what it was. And you were brave enough to explore that process to forgive. Because it's not for the faint of heart. I mean... <laughs> It is not. Not at all. And I really do appreciate your your courage and your compassion to forgive your family and to, you know, take a step back to heal and then deal with them from a different space. But yeah, you you have to always um, protect yourself. And so, yeah, I commend you. Uh, I think it's amazing. Um, and that says a lot about the substance of who you are. Tell us about the services that you offer. Well, um, I just moved to Montana this year. It was a big move. I'd been in urban areas, New York and L.A. for mm -hmm. most of my adulthood. And one of the reasons I made the move was I had this internal nudge and calling for a deeper connection with nature and quietude. And so I followed because I wanted to serve in a larger way. I've done a lot of consulting um, during my career and I still am continuing on with the consulting, but what I'm opening up to is to helping individuals and groups see their trauma, see their experiences that they may see as dark and scary or negative or unjust and take a different look at that. Yeah. Take a different look and see the beauty and find a pathway through to lead them to freedom. How can people get in touch with you? Well, if you go to susangold.us, that's susangold.us, um, you can connect me, with me on the site. You can send me an email, info at susangold.us, and I'll respond to that too. Awesome. 
Thank you so much, Susan Gold. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for being so transparent and open to not only heal yourself, but that you're on a mission to heal others through your story. That's amazing that you found something in your story that can not just found something in your story, but the fact that you, you could have easily kept it to yourself and just dealt with it and moved on and focused on, you know, uh, being a talent agent and stuff like that. But you found something in, in your story and in your journey, realizing that part of your purpose was to survive what you've been through so you can help others survive and so you can be a light. So thank you so much for being a light for other people who may not be able to find their way out or to figure out how to heal. So I really, really thank you for, for sharing your story with us. And I appreciate your work and the f- what you're doing, what you're putting out through your podcast, what you're contributing to the healing of this world and the beauty and the fearlessness with which you do it. Thanks, Siobhan. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. And to our listeners, I would love to hear from you. Thank you so much for taking time to tune in to Let's Talk About Healing. Make sure you like, share, and follow us. If you feel someone needs to hear this, please share it with them. And I hope that you are inspired, that you're able to look at what you've been through and realize that there's still a light. Every day that you wake up, there's still light. And that you can find your way to love. You owe it to yourself to grow and heal on purpose. Until next time, be blessed. Thank you for tuning in to Let's Talk About Healing with Yvonne Pierre on Hindsight Media Radio 103.5 FM. We hope you enjoyed the show. Be sure to subscribe, like, and share.